Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and today's episode is all about emotional versus logical business decisions. You know, this topic is something that I believe has been one of the reasons why I've had such a smooth mural career. You know, Taking the time to just step back and think logically before reacting has saved me in many art business situations. You know, there's so many things that happen and come up and miscommunication and whatnot and it's just deciding what to do, but burning bridges over emotional reactions and decisions, you know, versus looking at them more in a logical standpoint can cost you referrals. But more arguably, more important, you know, it can cost you your peace of mind. And then in this episode, I'm going to be sharing some of my personal business experiences, plus ones that I see pop up pretty frequently with other artists. And just to give you examples of emotional versus logical situations and different ways to handle it. And I don't want to scare you by talking about some of these negative things that come up, you know, when dealing with customers, because there's a whole lot of positivity in this whole art business. But, you know, I'd rather I just want to help you be better prepared for when these types of situations do end up, you know, coming up. And I want to preface this episode really quick with just a little fun announcement (laughs) in that we are expecting our first baby child (laughs) in November. And, you know, this topic, you know, making emotional decisions and reactions and all of that has been on my mind because as some of you can imagine, pregnancy can be a bit of emotional roller coaster. (laughs) And so I feel like lately I really had to step back even more and be like, okay, is my response logical? Is this the best thing to do? And yeah, I just want to talk about that really quick. So I, for the longest time, had a lot of reservations over, you know, starting a family. You know, I was very business focused. You know, my whole life I've wanted to have a business and set myself up and, you know, do all the things before starting a family. And I even had reservations about if I even wanted kids. I was like, no, maybe I'm meant to just be a business owner. And, you know, I have the Artist Academy. I teach people there. Like that kind of, you know, helps. And, but, you know, <laughs> hormones came a knock in this past January. And I just decided, now is the time. You know, I've prepped. I have my business where I want it to be. So there's no stress there, really. I have I have customers coming in. We have a good amount saved up. Like everything is just, it feels really good to be prepared. But I'm going to lie if I said there's like absolutely no fear. You know, there's always the thing of like, you know, is the baby healthy and whatnot. But in an art business standpoint, I definitely have this fear of, you know, when I announce it, which we haven't yet. So you're one of the first to know after, you know, people in the actual Artist Academy. And I have this fear of like, what if people see that I'm pregnant and they're not going to hire me? Oh my gosh. And so that's my like, you know, my emotional brain thinking. And so, you know, just on this topic of emotional versus logical, what I'm doing in that case is, you know, making it very known that I have help. I have helpers here locally that help me paint and get high, get to high places and all of that. So whenever it comes time to announce, whenever we do, probably here soon at some point, I am just going to be very, you know, upfront and like, I can still do your mural projects, <laughs> maybe up until like the last couple months. And so, yeah, there's just all these things, but it's mostly happy feelings. Uh, Just to talk about pregnancy really quick, I have had the smoothest time so far. I mean, it's still early. We're in the second trimester still, but and due in November. But so far, no nausea, very little symptoms at all. Like there's some times where I'm like, am I actually pregnant? Like, because it actually doesn't feel like it. And it hasn't really slowed me down much other than like maybe my mental state is more of like, less about growth and more about just like, okay, how do we, you know, make just as much money as last year, but maybe work less because we're going to have a baby this coming year and it's going to be, I'm going to be working less. So I'm already trying to be in the, in the position of working less, but making just as much, but not really in a growth mindset. And I think there's, there, you know, that there's a big difference in like going out and chasing and, you know, growing bigger and having higher numbers rather than just, you know, maintaining. And I'm just at a spot 
spot where, you know, if, if my business stayed exactly where it is for 10 years, I'd be pretty happy. <laughs> like at, at the end of 10 years, I'd probably be itching to grow a little bit more or whatnot. But I'm just, I've built my business up so far uh, with the intention of working hard in the beginning, putting in those extra hours, you know, just really hustling in the beginning to in order one day get to a point where I don't have to work as hard and I can focus on other things. And right now those other things are growing a baby. (laughs) And it's just nice to be in this place. And I'm having to remind myself again and again, like this is why I hustled so far and I can now relax a bit and do other things. And so we're so excited and (laughs) I'm excited to maybe a year from now, you know, make a whole podcast episode about how motherhood has changed my art business and whatnot, because I have a very naive (laughs) aspect or outlook about it. I'm thinking that it's going to be very easy because (laughs) pregnancy has been easy, you know, planning and everything is so far is so easy. And so you really can't tell me any different. (laughs) I I talk to a lot of my mom friends. They're like, oh, there's going to be hard days. And I'm like, "Mm, I don't know. I'm I'm very naive about it. So we'll see in about a year. I'll make a whole episode looking into how it's changed my art business and if that was really true. <laughs> and But yeah, I think it's just going to be a new fun journey. But anyway, okay, let's get into the podcast episode. Let's talk about emotional versus logical decision making. And I'd be lying if I said that I just, you know, came up with all of this stuff myself and I was always a super logical person because not to stereotype, but I am female. And what I have found, and this is not all the time, okay, but and I am very much, you know, just generalizing. But as a female, our brains just, we're just more on the emotional side, you know, because so like we care a lot more, you know, we're, we're more into our instincts. And there's a lot of good things that can come from that. Not saying being emotional is bad. But just, you know, having a reality check and knowing this, I think is, you know, in being just very real with myself and thinking, okay, You know, my first reaction to a lot of situations is to maybe be hurt or really, honestly, it's to be mad over being sad. Like some like I get mad pretty like I I can (laughs) get mad pretty easily. I'm not much of a crier. Like, Like like I said, most of my reactions are just to get mad. So I have to dial myself back and be like, okay, I know you're annoyed. Is there a logical reason for this? You know, what's a better way to handle this? And my husband actually is an extremely logical person. I don't say that just because like he's a guy and I'm not going to generalize being guys. I know very, I know a lot of emotional guys too. Okay. I'm not just picking on women here. (laughs) And I know a lot of very logical women, but in general, but anyway, so my husband is very logical and I run a lot of my decisions, you know, by him before I react. You know, I'm not just saying that because he's my spouse or because, you know, he has experience in business, you know, that he's a good person to lean on. It's because his mind is very logical and hardly ever emotional. You know, even in our like one-on-one little tidbit arguments, he hardly ever leads with emotion and can always look at it from a very logical perspective, which leads us rarely to fight. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like I tell him to quote, stop that (laughs) at least once a day at least. And I roll my eyes at him frequently. And, you know, oftentimes I'm the one that would get aggravated at something stupid that he's doing, (laughs) but rarely, he rarely gets emotionally upset at me. And I'm not trying to give like marriage advice or anything or like give you too much of an in on our relationship or anything of that sort. I'm just emphasizing the point that he's my logical side to lean on. And if you have a very logical person in your life who can look at things from an outside perspective, it might be a good idea to lean on them. If you have a friend who is equally as emotional as you, I don't think that that is (laughs) a good person to lean on. If you have a spouse that is equally as emotional as you, I don't recommend that either. But maybe if you could find someone that is just a very logical person and how you can find that is they don't like emotionally overreact very often. I mean, we all have emotions, especially when it's brought on by maybe certain situations, but 
in general, my husband just really doesn't get that mad at me, <laughs> which is fantastic. Like sometimes I'll poke him and be like, are you sure? Like I'm not doing something that's annoying you. Like maybe when I leave my clothes on the on the floor, like does that really upset you? Like and really just try to get at him. He's like, no, I mean, yeah, you could pick it up. But like, whatever, I don't care. I'm like he's just very easygoing. And so that's what I want to bring into my art business because working with somebody who is easygoing and who is a very logical thinker rather than blowing up on a customer, that's what I want. I I want to be easygoing, you know, not to the point of getting walked all over, you know, but I think just having that person, you know, and just leaning on them is a really good thing. And if you don't have someone like that, I'm just going to for sure, like post it in the Artist Academy Facebook group. You know, we've made these Facebook groups, whether you're in the advanced group or just the free Artist Academy Facebook group, post it in there because I do a lot of like digging on there and like I don't let people in who are going to say something mean or or and a lot of my customers are not in there, which is why I share a lot of, you know, all the the behind the scenes stuff. So I'll post something on Facebook onto my my public page and then I'll share it inside of our Artist Academy Advanced Facebook group and I'll share the ins and outs like, hey, this customer was really great to work with or this one like had a lot of changes. This is exactly what I charged. This is what I felt like it was worth. I give more in details in the Facebook groups because I feel like it's a much safer place and I know that my customers aren't going to see that, which I'm not talking bad on my customers, but I just think that they just don't need to see the the stuff, the advice that I'm giving other artists of what I would have done differently or how I think I got a really great deal out of this, how I made a bunch per hour or maybe how I didn't. So I use those Arts County Facebook groups. If you have a situation where maybe it's one that I'm about to explain, if you're in a situation right now and you're like, I don't know how to handle it or like you're feeling like really overheated by it or you think you know how to handle it, but it's making you emotional post it in there because a lot of the times this is where I'm getting a lot of my content. People will post in the Artist Academy Facebook groups, mostly in the advanced group, but, and they'll be like, a customer asked for this and, oh oh my gosh, like, is this, is this unreasonable of me to price this much? And like, we'll either hype you up or we'll talk you off a ledge. And so if you don't have anybody, you know, in your life that you feel really comfortable asking, ask us, because I'm going to chime in too. I see everything that people post in there and I will gladly help give you advice. Okay. Anyway, I'm going to go through a couple different situations of things that I've been in and other Artist Academy members and just to go through the the different ways of reacting. And it, one, I think the most common one is the customer wanting changes. And I don't have a thick skin on every topic that I'm about to tell you. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not putting myself on a pedestal this whole time. But this one, I have a pretty thick skin about this topic, <laughs> mostly because I started my career working for Bass Pro Shops. It AKA the outdoor store, if you've read my book. (laughs) And I would paint for them. And I was around artists who were so much better than me (laughs) because I was still, you know, my young 20s and new and learning. And I was just around muralists who are much better. And there would be times where I would paint something and they would ask another muralist to come in and paint over it and make it better. And I'd be like, Ugh, great things. Oh my gosh, ripped my heart out. And, you know, there'd be times where somebody else, not, not even me, like it, they would finish a mural and then a month later, the boss comes in. And it's like, eh, I want that changed. Like, let's just take that out. We're going to put in a big buffalo scene instead of the zebras here. And months of work would just be painted over just like that. So when customers want changes, it's that is how I came into this world, this muralist world. And that's just what I'm used to. So I have just had a thick skin over it. And, you know, even just recently, I was painting with a customer or no, I was mocking something up for a customer and I've had this idea for a long time. They have a local gym and I was so excited because I pitched this idea to a different gym here in the past. I'm talking like four or five years ago. I pitched this idea to have this big barbell with inspirational words inside of it. It's going to be beautiful, classic, black and white. And I was just in love with it. Just like classy. I was so excited. And so I pitched it to them because they mentioned that they wanted something custom in their gym. And I was like, this one, ah, I've been waiting for the perfect spot. And they came back and they're like, that's great, but can we add neon to it? <laughs> and I was like, oh, dang it. My idea of this classy, beautiful mural that I've had, you know, on my wish list forever, you're just going to change it and whatever. So I started adding colors to it and I was like, you know, it's not too bad. 
And I'm actually currently in the middle of painting it as I'm recording this right now, recording these pretty early in advance to prepare for baby time. I'm getting months ahead. But anyway, painting it right now. And I'm actually really loving it (laughs) the way that they suggested it way more. I think it just adds way more a glow effect. Plus, we're doing the black and white inspirational into it. And it kind of looks like tattoos. I don't know. It just looks really cool and just really in a fun, modern way. And I'm, I'm just really glad that they said that. So which just goes to my point, a lot of people will request changes whenever you're either designing or in the middle of it. And a lot of times, especially in the beginning, you know, it can feel like you're like, oh, you don't like my idea or, you know, the emotional side of us is like, why would they want that? Oh, no, like this is. But more often than not, the customer suggestions that I get actually make it look better. (laughs) I mean, sometimes, sometimes people knock off my creativity and I'm like, oh, this could have been great. Now it's just basic because they don't have the budget or whatnot. But sometimes, I mean, they're looking at it from an outside perspective. And yes, they have their own tastes and it's going to clash with ours. But I think keeping an open mind when they want changes, either in the beginning and or at the end, I just want to, you know, re-say though, I've said this a million times, but I tell customers in the beginning, it is so easy for me to change things up and add something here or there or change a background or whatnot in the sketching process. But it is very hard to do it when we're at the end and I'm saying, look what I painted for you. And then they want to change stuff. It can be tough. (laughs) So I just make sure to, you know, reiterate in the beginning, if you want something changed and a lot of the times I'll ask, you know, can you make this better? How can I make this better for you? Because really it's their eyes that are going to be looking at it every day. I'm going to have the picture of it and I'm likely not going to go back to that mural ever. I'm not going to go in that gym (laughs) and I just, I'm not going to go back, but they're going to see it all the time. So however they want it done is the way to go. Okay. That's number one of just not keeping it, you know, personal. It's just because it's your style. You know, we can mesh with other people's style. That's part of being a commissioned artist. So another one I do not have a thick skin with yet. I'm telling you, I am not perfect in these, but I just want to share. So customers not receiving their artwork in the mail. This, I don't know why customers automatically blame me when items don't arrive. You know, they ask They ask, where is it? And all these questions, like, I know how the post office operates. And to be blunt, every single time, some customers like, I haven't received my package yet. Where is it? (laughs) I want to say, what does the tracking number say? That's your answer. (laughs) I swear. You know, I don't have special powers to make the package get sent to you faster. I can't contact USPS and be like, yo, where's the package? Can you get it to her faster? What happened to it? I don't know. (laughs) I can send an inquiry and they will maybe or maybe not look at it because they're dealing with thousands upon thousands of packages per day. They don't really care about Susie's five by seven print that I sent two weeks ago that not there yet. That's actually in another country. So that's probably why, because for every time I send something to another country, it takes an absurd amount of time to get there. And then I have people saying, where's my package? And I'm, I'm like, I don't know. What does the tracking number say? Oh, so obviously I'm emotionally sensitive to this subject, <laughs> but let's take a step back and look at the facts. <laughs> a customer paid for an item that they did not receive. Stupid tracking questions aside, What if you didn't receive an item? What if I didn't receive an item? You'd be like, where is it? Uh, Really, a lot of the times when I don't receive something, I'm like, it'll turn up eventually. I like, I don't even email the people because I know what it feels like. (laughs) And I'm like, it'll turn up eventually. If two months go by and I'm like, yo, where's my package? And it got lost. Like, I'm obviously going to be like, hey, I paid for this. You sent it to me. It didn't get to me. Can I either get a refund or can you send it again? And nobody likes to do this, right? Like this is another emotional thing if you're like, it's annoying to send something again. I've had to send books. I've had to send prints uh, again. And it just comes down to (laughs) if I bought the (laughs) insurance when I shipped something. And just between you and me, I shipped something big earlier this year, and it pains me to think about it. It was like a $350 item, and I did not buy the extra insurance. It came with like $50 of insurance, and I was like, yeah, that's fine, whatever, it's going to Texas, it doesn't matter. 
I did not buy the extra insurance and it never made it. And I filed an inquiry and I did all of the things and I'm out $350 because I didn't do that. And I know better. I know better. Okay. <laughs> like I didn't cry, but I did get mad. <laughs> I was just like mad at myself because like I... Uh, Okay, stepping back. So what if a customer contacts you and they're like, hey, I never received my stuff. And you're like, I'll check the freaking tracking number. And you do. So I track it for them and I just give them the same link that I, you know, I sent them. I check it, I click it and it automatically pops up USPS and it says delivered. And I say, it's been delivered. And they say, I don't have it though. (laughs) This actually came up uh, in a group of friends that I was talking to. I think it was last year, one of my friends sent out a piece of clothing and it didn't arrive. And so they were like, some of my friends were like, she's lying. Like, she's just trying to get more money for another item from you. Like, "Uh, it's not your fault. Like, no, don't, you know, don't refund her. Like, blah, blah, blah. Like, I chimed in. I was like, "Uh, hello. (laughs) No, (laughs) it's, it is a hundred percent our fault because did you buy the insurance and they were new and they said oh no and I'm like that's okay sometimes I don't as well but now you know luckily her item was like a $16 item so usually if it's under $100 or under $50 USPS comes with automatic insurance so just so you know If it's over that, you have to pay for a little bit extra. But so, you know, instead of looking at it as an emotional thing and making up a story in our heads of maybe the customer got it and they're lying to you or, you know, maybe they're just wanting to get another item or whatever story we're making up in our heads, you know, when you come across a decision that you have to make, I think that's the first thing I ask myself. Is there a story that I'm completely making up in my head about what happened and what what are the facts? The facts are that she didn't receive it and that's it. I don't know why. I don't know if it's because USPS didn't do their job. I don't know if it got stolen. I don't don't know. Whatever it is, she didn't receive it and I need to make that right. So the only resolution for this is you contact the customer and you ask them and hopefully it was an original painting. Gosh, although this did happen recently to my friend Tiffany in the Artist Academy. We were talking about it. She sent an original painting to a customer and she didn't receive it. It probably got stolen off of her thing. It's just heart-wrenching because there's like almost no amount of insurance you can buy just covers that in your in your heart but and so she's like what do I do it's like okay just talk to her does she want you to send a new one do you want to just refund her what does she want and that's what I suggest to do in that most likely they'll say ship me another one that's probably the best response just because you know they ordered it in the first place they want it sometimes they'll just be like oh forget about it you know it was for something and now the time's passed never mind sorry and then you can just refund them it doesn't matter the answer is to communicate with your customer and say I'm so sorry A lot of times I'll be like, this was out of my hands because it's completely the the post office situation or it's just out of my hands. So just reminding them of that, I think is okay, even even though that might be me, you know, reacting out of emotion, just to remind them that it's not my fault. So don't be, you know, don't be snooty with me. Thanks. And, you know, just go from there. There's no interest. There's no need to assume and figure things out. It's just let's look at it logically and the numbers. You know, another one is say someone chooses a different artist over you. Like say maybe you both put in a bid or like you have a friend who chooses a different artist or you, you know, you know a customer who chooses an artist that you introduce to them or, you know, there's there's so many different things. When you know someone you know, has chosen a different artist. This actually happened to me recently with a friend group. (laughs) One of my friends asked another one of my friends to paint a kid's room for them. And I was like, wait, what? Why wouldn't she ask me? Like, I knew her first. Why? Like, what the heck? And I was like, I know she probably thinks I'm just busy. And I know that, or at least that was the story I made up in my head because my, my logical brain, like, told me, that a lot of my past interactions in the past year, a lot of people have come to me and said, oh, I had this and I I, I gave it to this person because I, I, I know how busy you are. And I was like, wait, 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 <laughs> wait, you gave away a big logo project to someone else? Why? And they're like, well, you're just, you're busy. You already have projects going on. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> like, I would like to do that too. Like, I can, <laughs> I can, do, or like a lot of people, I don't know, they're just, they just say to me, Like, I know how busy you are, so I don't want to bother you with something. A lot of people say, hey, you're too busy. And so I hear that a lot. And I'm always like, I mean, sometimes, like when I I was writing my book, I was really busy. But like, 
now like I can make things work, especially if it's something I really want to do. So just ask me. And so I've had to have those conversations with people. But so my logical brain was like, okay, my friend knows how busy I am. And she probably chose this other artist because she doesn't think she's as busy as me. And so that's that. But my brain just goes down these rabbit holes of like, wait, what if her daughter who the room is being painted for doesn't like my art? What if she likes the art of the other artist over me? Oh my, that I couldn't handle. It's like, I love this little girl. Like, And I think you can blame it on pregnancy brain or just anybody's brain. You just, you know, it's like when you don't get invited to a party, like maybe likely by accident because people just forgot or, you know, people just aren't thinking or whatever. Like it's the same kind of thing. You're like, you go down as like, what if they're dating someone now that hates me? What if? And you just go down this rabbit hole of negativity when the facts are, you could just come back to it and you can ask the person, which I did. It's like, hey, um, um, why? And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Like, yeah, you're, you're totally right. I thought you were busy. I was like, okay, well, maybe next time, like, just like ask me (laughs) like don't assume I'm busy and like she's like oh I'm so sorry like anyway moving on to the next one say say you have a customer and they reached out for to you for a quote and you're a newer muralist or a newer artist and you're so excited because these are two possible big projects that could probably take up like a week or two or three and you're like oh my gosh this is exciting and this is actually an exact a situation from an artist that's in the artist academy who I talked to recently and they say your customer says hi we'd like two you know big murals or whatnot and you're like okay great and so you you know you might do like a quick sketch for them be like okay it's gonna be this much and (laughs) they come back and say unfortunately I think this is gonna be priced out of what we're looking for and this is actually an exact quote and they also say you know we may go with a vinyl application which would be a fraction of the cost thank you so much for your time and <laughs> you go from being really excited to getting work which may be some of your first you know couple jobs and you know it could be a substantial paycheck for you to hearing I want vinyl instead. (laughs) And I'm going to tell you, nothing says I'm cheap more than that. And I think it just comes back to saying in your mind, you know, like some people have the budget for hand done murals and windows and all of that. And some people don't. And that's just that. That is the logical factor in that. And nowadays, just to be honest, like I get approached for window lettering sometimes. And if they want absolute perfect letters with complete straight lines, like like really looking like it came out of a printer, I will sometimes refer them to vinyl because I know that a hand done letter in perfect lines and all of that, it's going to last a long time, but it's going to cost them like three times as more than vinyl would. And so if I'm getting a sense that they really don't want to spend that much and it's only going to be up for a short amount of time, that's also key. I will say, hey, you could get this printed on vinyl in one color for about a hundred bucks. Maybe just do that and you can just peel it off afterwards. And then when you're looking for something that you're wanting more permanent and you want that's really stylized, it's not just, you know, a font that you can print out, then call me. And sometimes people do that. And then sometimes they're like, oh, no, 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 we want something more stylized. You know, just it's just about having that conversation with them. But so someone, a member of the Arts Academy, posted this exact situation in the Academy Facebook group here recently. And so we all kind of came to her rescue because she was feeling pretty down. And so she was thinking, you know, things like, did I price this too high? Are my prices ridiculous? Which is the first thing we always think of, right? That emotional, like, oh my gosh, like people are going to call me out for trying to make so much money with a paintbrush. Like, oh, the starving artist is a thing. And you just go down this rabbit hole. When... <laughs> No, they probably just don't have a budget for it, you know, but like, or you like, you could think in your mind, are they lying? Are they just trying to just get me down on price? Like, so, so that I do that. But if you look back and read or listen to their message, I don't think that they're trying to, you know, get the price down. And I don't think that they think, you know, the prices are crazy extreme. I think they just don't have the budget, just like they said. (laughs) And those are the facts of that. Like they told you exactly what the situation was. Like we can't afford that. Sorry, we're going to try to do it cheaply. You know, I think they probably will realize that it's not going to last very long, but that's what cheap gives you. And I have had a lot 
a lot of customers ask me for a price. They're so excited, like whatever it is. And then I get excited, like, oh, that's a really cool kids room idea. That's a really cool this, that. And then I give them the price and I just don't hear anything back, which is like the most annoying thing, right? When they just ghost you because then you're like, do I check in on it? Do it? And really, I'm at this point where like, I don't have time to check in with people anymore. If you want it, reach out to me. I will respond to you. But if you don't respond to me back, like, I don't know. Unless it's a really, really big one that I really want. But in general, like if just a window painting or something, really anything, a thousand dollars or less, I'm like, okay, yeah, if you want it, great. If not, great. I don't care. Another situation is whenever customers ask you to come back and fix something. So this has happened many times to me and or like artists in the academy where, you know, something something happened, whether with the weather on a window painting or somebody hit the wall or something like that. Like it, it's happened a handful of times. And just recently, it actually happened to me. So I painted this big mural outdoors about three years ago. And the exterior paint that I use, it's a Benjamin Moore exterior, typically like a satin or whatnot. It typically sticks to whatever surface pretty well. I, I rarely get these calls yet. I mean, I have some logos that I did in pure black that looks like I did them yesterday when I really did them like seven years ago. Like the paint can typically hold up well. So I was surprised to hear that a customer emailed me. And it's so funny because this email, oh, I'm going to read this to you the way that I perceived it at first, because going back and reading it now, which I've actually gone back and read it like recently to be like, okay, she's really not meaning it to be that bad. But when I first read it, I took it emotionally. And I was like, I basically put an emotion onto her email that had absolutely no emotion to it. So I'm just going to read it. Hello, Andrea, your murals at blank like this place property are experiencing bubbling, flaking and streaking. See attached photos. We have murals that are of similar age painted the same surface material and exposed to the same elements that are not experiencing this, which is what got us stumped from a maintenance standpoint. We wanted to reach out to you to troubleshoot these ideas and ask if you have experienced these before in your line of work and see if you have any suggestions for fixing them best. <laughs> and that's how I read it the first time, which is not how she wrote it. <laughs> so to me, the story I was making in my mind with this <laughs> email was, other people have painted murals for us and they're just fine. But for some reason, yours are bad and you need to fix it. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> it's been so I was looking at the photos and it's because of there's water running off of it's like on a wall and there's a sidewalk above it and there's like dirty water that's running off onto the mural. So it's has this streaking effect. And to me, I'm like, Obviously, it's dirty water that's making the streaking, but she can't see that. She thinks the paint is just streaking dirty. I don't know. I don't know. I was just like, duh. But I responded very nicely, letting her know that it's because of the water. And also there were some spots peeling off where it got heavy water rainfall down, which typically a mural is completely fine with rain on it. I think it just in these spots, it got way more rain and like, I'm not really sure why it was flaking off, but I was like, maybe I should have used a primer. I don't know. So I wrote back as nicely as possible and pointed out, you know, like some of the spots that she was showing was absolutely, there's nothing we can do about it and suggested that she get a bumper or something to line the edge so that there's not a, you know, water runoff coming and streaking the mural. I was like, if you just clean it with soap and water, you know, it's, I, I really tried not to be you know, very snooty about it. But I was like, it just, you know, clean it. It's just like every other surface. It's outside. It's going to get dirty. I'm like, duh. But I was just like, it's not my fault. Like, don't yell at me. When she really, she was not yelling at me at all. She was just like, hey, we have a problem. Can you help us fix this? That's the tone she had. Like, really, that's the tone. I was just annoyed because I, when you're painting a project, especially in the end, like if they ask you to come back immediately or they ask you to come back years later, you're like, no, 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 I've closed that portion. I don't want to work on that anymore. And actually that exact mural we worked on in the summer and it was really hot. And I look at it now and that's all I think about it was just discomfort. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't want to go out there, but whatever. So I went out there myself and I looked at it. They tried to clean it off. The streaks won't come off. So they asked for a quote to come back and fix it and they're going to put a bumper up. And so I gave them a quote and yeah, it's just, it's a very logical business decision. And that was that, like it's, there's 
absolutely no. But I just felt like when I received that, I was like, I need to stick up for myself. My murals are just as good as everybody else's. Like, and I was like, no, no, back up. Like send a very nice email. And I really, I didn't send it with attitude or anything. I was just like, these are the facts. This is what I can do but you need to block off the area so that we don't get water because I'm just going to keep coming back and doing this. It's going to keep looking like that. Anyway, okay. And you know, we've talked about a lot of like customer interactions, but a big one in thinking logically is when dealing with local artists. So like other artists, like artist competition or community and whatnot. And this topic, I'm actually going to make a whole episode about it coming up because I've worked with, competed with, met, (laughs) been trained by, I've mentored, I've hired, and I just know many other artists. And it's not if you'll run into an issue with another local artist, it's when. And so I'll share my thoughts on this topic in the next solo episode. But just to lead you on this one last one, we've been talking a lot about customer interactions and emotional versus logical on that one. But I think a big one, you know, aside from the customers and, you know, other people is coming back into yourself. And like maybe you're stuck on where to go next in your business and what steps you should take and you're scared of making the wrong one. I would say it's the exact same as this. You know, a lot of the times we are way too close to, you know, our talents and our gifts and our situations and to really see, you know, to make a logical decision, which is why I run a lot of my decisions by my very logical husband. I'm like, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. This is the money it's going to bring in. This is how long I think it's going to take. These are the complications that I think are going to arise. Like, do you think it's going to be worth it? And I sometimes I figure it out on my own. And sometimes he's like, yeah, sure, go with it. And just like him saying, yeah, sure, go with it. Whatever, try it. It's enough for me to be like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, just like running it by someone else. But I think we all have the ability, you know, to decide for ourselves as well, whether you want to lean on someone else or not. You know, we all know what we truly want to do and what makes us comfortable and the next step that we need to take. And so, you know, if you're in this position of like, should I do murals? Because I know you've listened to the May mural month and you're like, oh my gosh, and look at all the money they're making and whatnot. Or, you know, should I focus on prints or should I focus on this? Like, look at it from a logical standpoint. Like, how much money can this make you? You know, how happy is this going to make you? You know, how strenuous, you know, I might, you're going to have to travel for this job. Like, can you do this while you kids are running around? Like, all that, like, look at it from a logical standpoint. And I actually, <laughs> I did this whenever, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> so I did this back in the day when I was like dating. Like, if I wanted to break up with a guy, I would literally write down like positives of him and negatives <laughs> of him. And then I really would realize that, okay, I'm I'm having to make a list. I should probably just leave (laughs) this dude. (laughs) So, but you could do that with some kind of decisions that you need to make. What are the positives on one end? What are the negatives on the other? And write out the numbers, like what you can make in the amount of time. Like just write it out logically and think about it on paper. How does something look on paper? Because when it's on our head, we create all these stories of like, what if I'm on a mural site and I fall off a ladder? Oh my gosh, what? Like, uh, so in a logical standpoint, that would look like I would buy insurance and it would cost this much and it would protect me from any kind of ladder fall. Just in happen that that would happen. You know, there's just so many things of, or like, how am I going to get customers? Oh my gosh. Blah, blah, blah. Like, as a logical standpoint, on paper, you would say, I'm going to reach out to other artists and see how they are getting customers. Or I am going to reach out to customers and walk around with a flyer trying to get window painting. Or I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that. Write it out logically. And if you're not sure of how to write it out logically, I do student spotlights where I talk to my Arts County Advanced students one-on-one. You can book them. We also have virtual meetup calls every week that you can come in and you can talk to a group collective if you're having trouble making those decisions for yourself. And if you don't maybe have a logical person or have someone who has done it before you or believes in you quite yet because... No matter who it is, whether it's your spouse, your family or whatever, nobody's going to really understand, you know, what you can accomplish until you show them. So I'm like, I don't really advocate, you know, asking someone else for business advice, especially art business advice when they haven't ran an art business themselves or, you know, if they're still skeptical about it. Like I've obviously like with my husband, I'll ask him stuff every once in a while, but I've like proven myself to him. He's like, yeah, you can do whatever you want. I've proven that to myself too. 
But if you're talking to people and asking them and they're not quite 100% on board, don't go with what they say. Like, come to me and I'll be like, hey, maybe you should, you know, I'll, I'll give you personal advice on what I think you should do or at least give you the options. I'm never going to tell you what to do, but I'll be like, if I was in your shoes, this might be the route I'll go in. Or you could come to our virtual meetups or ask questions with experienced artists. In the Artist Academy Advance, we have artists who have gone through the program long gone and they're like, I'm just going to stay to give advice to people. And I'm like, thank you so much. <laughs> and so we have veterans in there that can give you advice from something. Like, we've all been through it. We're all in that, you know, we've been in that stage that you're currently in and we can help you through it. You know, a mentor can see your future way more clearly than you can. So if you're in a point where you're trying to make a logical or any kind of decision and you're like, you're emotionally into it and you're like, I don't know what to do and it's overwhelming you, really easy. Like join the academy. <laughs> it's really, really inexpensive. Like sadly cheap. It's like $32 a month for the advanced program and then $45 a month for the master's program. That's it. That's literally it. And for that amount, the amount that you spend on coffee per month, you can have your art business pointing you in the right direction with people who have been there. Like I started this a long time ago because I'm in this position now and I could have gotten here so much faster if I had someone telling me, hey, yeah, do this rather than me just like freaking throwing things, you know, and seeing what sticks. But whatever, we made it. <laughs> and I'm thankful for it and I want to help you do it too because really the introduction to this is very meaningful to me, you know, like helping you create a life of creativity and financial freedom. The hustle culture thing is getting knocked lately and all that, but there is something to it, like working your butt off in order to get where you want to be and then having the mental peace while you're there to live your life in a better way. You know, it's not, not all about money, but, you know, having that creativity and the freedom and all of that, like, it just makes your life better. You know, I was talking to Samantha, who I work with here locally, and I've trained and mentored, and now she's she's on her way to make her first six-figure year. And she just started, like, this will be, by the end of this year, it'll be about three years ago. It's so like a three full years. And on her third year, she'll I'm going to just throw it out there. She's going to make six figures this year. And we were talking and I'm like, do you remember whenever, you know, like back in the day when like we used to, you know, live paycheck to paycheck and whatnot. And she's like, yeah, she's like, we literally, and that's just the way it was. Like that's, we just thought it was. And she was like, to quote, she was like, it's just nice to have some like blanket, like a comfort. I'm like, yes, exactly. <laughs> and you know, if I can do it, if she can do it, you can do it too. And so we're here to help you. And like using Samantha as an example, like she's made six figures fairly quickly and you know, because she has guidance and she worked her butt off to do it. And yeah, you can do it too. So, okay artistacademy.co. You can apply for the academy. And I hope that you are faced with a decision here in the next week. And then this episode is fresh in your mind because it was meant to be there. And I hope you make the right decision and your art business flourishes because of it. And we don't burn bridges. And I want to change the narrative of artists are easy to work with because there is a narrative out there that a lot of people say, Ugh, artists are so hard to work with in so many ways. And I'm like, no, no, no. Like, we can change this. Like, we're just, you know, we're just people just trying to figure out how to run a business, like, in the most logical, not emotional way. And we're just figuring it out. Give us a break. But I, you know, I want to help you. And this is part of that. Okay. Hope you guys have a great week. I'll see you in the next episode next week. <laughs>